Okay, we we can now begin our session. Again, welcome um, and thank you for joining this call today. We plan to review the IDR process for disputing parties and answer questions that we've received as we go through each step in the process. We'll save time at the end to try to answer additional questions if we are able, but if we don't have time, we'll make sure to follow up after the meeting with further questions. So today this information provided is intended only to be general information, um, summary of tech and the summary of technical legal standards. It's not intended to take place of statutes or regs or formal policy guidance um, upon which it is based. The presentation is a summary of the current uh, operations. And we encourage everyone on the call um, to reach out if you have questions. The content of the document does not have the force and effect of law and are not permitted to bind the public in any way. This communication was created at the expense of US tax dollars. So again, today we're going to take a look at department announcements and then walk through that process and Q&A that I just spoke about. As a reminder, many of you were on the IDR meeting that the departments held on Friday the 8th. But for those who were unable to attend, we wanted to have a quick update on recent an announcements from the department. On February 23rd, the U.S. District Court of, of um, Eastern District of Texas invalidated portions of the interim final rule requirements related to surprise billing part two that was issued and governs the IDR process. Due to the decision, the department's announced steps were taking to conform to the court's order, and specifically the department's withdrew guidance documents that were based on um, or that referred to portions of the rule that the court invalidated. Yesterday, we updated the guidance and reposted that to conform to the court's order, so you'll find new guidance documents at cms.gov. In addition, on the 5th, the department's announced the online IBR portal is planned to launch this week. In the near future, we plan to host a webinar to take an in-depth look at the IDR process and give a demo of the federal IDR portal. Let's get started with the steps preceding the IDR process. There are several steps parties must go through prior to the start of the federal IDR process. The first starts when a furnished covered item or service results in a charge for emergency items or services from an out of network provider or facility for non emergency items or services from an out of network provider at an in-network facility, or for air ambulance services from an out-of-network provider of air ambulance services. And each of these boxes in the graph you see on the slide represent a sort of step in this process. So in step two, within 30 calendar days, the initial payment or notice of denial of payment must be sent by the plan issuer or carrier. The plan must include with this initial payment or denial of payment, payment the appropriate person or office to contact provider facility or provider of air ambulance services wishes to initiate open negotiations. They must also include a statement that if the open negotiation period does not result in an agreement on the out of network rate, either party to, is able to, uh, um, either party, excuse me, to the open negotiation may initiate the federal IDR process. The applicable qualified payment amount for each item or service must also be included by the plan. 
in step three of this process, the parties must initiate open negotiation period, if that's the desire, within 30 business days, beginning on the day the out-of-network provider receives either an initial payment or the notice of denial of payment. So again, either party may initiate open negotiation, but both parties must in good faith actively participate in the open negotiation period and provide all the required information that's necessary if the open negotiation is unsuccessful and the parties choose to use the federal IDR process. So the initiating party in the open negotiation must provide written notice to the other party of its intent to negotiate. This is referred to as the open negotiation notice, and it must include information sufficient to identify the items and services that are subject to negotiation. These items that must be included are the date the items or services were furnished, corresponding service codes for the items or services, the initial payment amount or payment as applicable, any offer for the out of network rate and contact information of the party sending the open negotiation. And again, these things should have been found in the payment or denial of payment by the plan. And so the departments have received several questions regarding applicability of the federal IDR process and the open negotiation period that we'd like to try to clarify before moving IDR initiation. The first question is how does the non-initiating party know if the items or services are eligible under the No Surprises Act if there's no way to know anything other than the services and CPT codes? I'll turn it over to you, Matt, for a response. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So with the initial payment or the denial of payment that uh, payers are sending, uh, it's required to include a statement that the QPA applies for the purpose of the recognized amount. And so the interim final rules require that a statement from the plan or issuer that the QPA applies for purposes of the recognized amount so that providers and facilities will understand that the plan or issuer has determined that neither an all payer model agreement or specified state law applies for purposes of calculating a participant's cost sharing amount, but rather this cost sharing amount would be calculated using the QPA. So the departments expect that in most, if not all cases, the QPA will serve as the basis for determining the recognized amount and the federal IDR process will govern any dispute over the payment instead of a specified state law or process. Matt, the next question is many people calculate QPA different. Does the party have to provide details on how it is calculated? Absolutely. Thanks, Amanda. So the first surprise billing interim final rules set forth how the QPA must be calculated and require that plans and issuers make certain disclosures with each initial payment or notice of denial of payment and that plans or issuers must provide additional information upon request of the provider or facility. And this information must be provided in writing and either on paper or electronically to a non-participating provider or emergency facility or provider of air ambulance services is applicable when the QPA serves as the recognized amount. And this information should be provided by the initiating party with the notice of IDR initiation. Thanks, Matt. And the last question in this section that we received that we'll go over today is, will the department be giving guidance on adding sufficient information to identify the customer and claim? From our experience in negotiations, there is not sufficient information to identify the customer or claim on the form as it exists today. We have found providers are solved for that by adding their own fields to the form, by doing or email with the identifying information 
or by including information with the form, such as an EOB that will help to identify the customer. In some cases, we are having to reach back out for information if the provider hasn't proactively provided that to us. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So the current open negotiation notice requires a description of the item or service, which should include information that sufficiently identifies the item or services that are being disputed. And then also, I just want to note that updated guidance that uh, the departments have posted notes that as part of open negotiations, the non-initiating party can request that the initiating party provide additional information that will identify the claim that's in the dispute. So this would include things such as a claim reference number or the location of the service. Thank you, Matt, for providing those responses. Now let's take a look at the federal IDR process after the open negotiation period. The federal IDR process may be initiated within four days after the last day of open negotiation period if parties do not reach an agreement on an out-of-network rate. The departments will open the federal IDR portal this week and make available the online web form to initiate IDR. When the initiating party submits the IDR initiation form, the initiation is sent to the departments by the federal IDR portal or our online system. If your negotiation period ended prior to the IDR portal opening, the department will permit submission of a notice of initiation of the IDR process within 15 business days following the opening of the IDR portal. The initiating party is also required to provide a copy of the initiation form to the non-initiating party which can be done electronically if they have a good faith belief that the other party will receive the electronic communication. And they must also provide it in paper form at no cost if requested. The IDR initiation form is another step in this process for which we've received questions. So we'll try to provide clarification by answering a few of those questions now. First question says, we are following the guidance for the No Surprises Act, but are not clear on how to initiate arbitration, and the open period is now passing. I'll ask Albert to please respond to this question. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so the department's announced that the portal will be going live um, the week of April 11th on the No Surprises website. So for disputes for which the open negotiation period has expired, the departments will permit submission of a notice of initiation of the IDR process within 15 business days following the opening of the IDR portal. For example, if the portal opens on April 15th, then parties whose open negotiation period expired before April 15th will have until May 6th to initiate, May 6th being 15 business days. Thank you. Thanks, Alper. The next question is, plan detail should be included on the initiation web form. Plan de details need to be included um, are funding, whether it's fully insured or self-insured, and contract information for each state. This information is needed for the IDRE to determine eligibility of a claim or service under a state law or the federal law. Without this level of detail, eligibility cannot be determined. And Matt, if I could ask you to answer that. Yeah, sure, Amanda. So the location of where the items and services were furnished is required to be provided on the notice of IDR initiation form. And information on the QPA, which only applies again if a specified state law or all pair model agreement doesn't apply, must also be provided as well. Also, if parties to dispute, or excuse me, if parties dispute the applicability of the IDR process, they'll provide the certified IDR entity with uh, information disputing that the claims are eligible with their notice of selection of failure to select a certified IDR entity. 
this information will help IDREs figure out if an all payer model agreement or specified state law applies and therefore the federal IDR process would not apply. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. And the final question on this step is, will the IDR notice that is created by the initiating party be available through the portal or is the only way for the non-initiating party to receive it is for the initiating party to send it? Alper, if you could respond. Sure. Thanks, Amanda. Yes. So the initiating party has to send a copy of the initiation web form, web form directly to the non-initiating party. The notice will not be available in the portal for the other party to access. So it must be sent, um, copy initiation web form must be sent directly to the non-initiating party. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Now let's look at the second step in the federal IDR process, which is selection of the IDR entity. The non-initiating party will receive an email from the federal IDR portal notifying them of the initiating party's preferred certified IDR entity that also includes a secure link to agree with the selection or make an alternative selection. You'll also have to attest to a conflict of interest statement and attest to the applicability of the federal IDR process. The non-initiating party must respond on this form within three business days. Cannot agree on the selection of a certified IDR entity within those three business days after initiation, then the departments will randomly select a certified IDR entity no later than six business days after the date of initiation of the federal IDR process and will notify the parties of the selection by email from the federal IDR portal. Once a certified IDR entity is selected, a notice will be sent to the certified IDR entity from the federal IDR portal and the entity will review the dispute to make um, its eligibility for the IDR process determination, as well as attest to conflicts of interest within three business days. Making an eligibility determination requires the certified IDR entity to review whether any specified state laws or all pair model agreements are to the dispute in question. Because we receive several questions on eligibility, it's important to remember that the federal IDR process will be applicable in all states for certain plans. Some states allow self plans to opt into their state process, but it is not required that a self-funded plan opt into that state's process. Therefore, the federal process will be available to all self-insured plans who have not opted into their state's process. Similarly, the federal process will be available in all states for FEHB carriers who do not have a contract with the Office of Personnel Management that directs the carrier to use the state process. Other questions we've received on this step and the IDR process um, are as follows, and I will ask Matt again to respond. The first question, if the eligibility is in dispute, how would that be handled? Is there a way to dispute eligibility prior to the IDRE being assigned and fees incurred, or should eligibility disputes be sent to IDREs for them to resolve and make a determination? Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So currently the departments and the certified IDR entities will review for federal IDR process eligibility before any fees are collected. Thanks. Question says, if the IDRE agrees that claims are not eligible, will the party's IDRE fees be returned? Will this be established in guidance? So again, currently the certified IDR entity must conclude that the federal IDR process applies before administrative fees and certified IDR ent entity fees are paid.
And the, the next question, what if initiating and non-initiating parties enter different QPAs onto um, the forms that we have received at this point? Yeah, so the QPA is entered to be the QPA that's listed on the initial payment or notice of denial of payment. And the initiating party is responsible for uploading the relevant information with their notice of IDR initiation. Thank you. On those forms, um, what is the total offer or excuse me, is the total offer, the total allowed amount being requested or the amount being asked for in addition to what's already been paid? So the offer should represent the full amount that's requested, which includes any amounts already paid. And this figure should be expressed as both a dollar amount and a percentage of the QPA represented by that dollar amount. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. And I think uh, we have one more, um, one more question for you um, that we'll get to in just a few minutes. So um, in this um, selection process, after an IDRE is selected, then the no later um, than 10 business days after selection, each party will submit their certified IDR entity, um, a notice of offer form and supporting documentation. So sorry, some of those questions Matt just answered were related to those forms, but both parties will receive an email from the certified IDR entity, including a notice of offer form requesting each party respond to the email and again, include documentation. Guidance. Yesterday provides more about what must be included in the notice of offer form, but we'll answer a few questions to try to help clarify. And I'm going to pause for a moment while I try to take someone off the mute. Okay, sorry about that. There's quite a few people who aren't on mute who should be on mute. There are a lot of people. Please mute, guys. Matt, thanks again for mm -hmm. answering those questions about um, what should be included in, in those forms um, in the different QPAs. The other question that we had um, come in around the notice of offer form and what's being included there is what is the difference between bundled or batched? And, you know, this is the first time many people are seeing bundled throughout this process. So having a better understanding of that will be helpful. Yeah, so bundling refers to instances when a payer pays a single payment for multiple services that an individual received during an episode of care. So multiple services uh, received during, let's say, a knee replacement. When we're talking about batched items and services, this means multiple qualified IDR items and services that are considered jointly as part of one payment determination. And there are specific uh, rules that must be filed in order for um, a party to batch items and services together. So the first is that they must be billed by the same provider or group of providers or the same facility or the same provider of air ambulance service. The second requirement is that payment for the qualified items or services would be made by the same plan or issuer. The third requirement is that the qualified IDR items or services must be the same or similar items or services, meaning that they are billed under the same service code or a comparable code under a different procedural code system. And then finally, all the qualified IDR items and services must have been furnished within the same 30 business day period. Thank you. So if by the deadline for the parties to submit offers, one party has not submitted an offer, then the certified IDR entity will select the other party's offer as the final payment amount. 
In addition, each party must pay the certified IDR entity fee to the certified IDR entity with the submission of its offer and pay the administrative fee by the time it submits its offer. Therefore, an offer will not be considered received by the certified IDR entity until the certified IDR entity fee and the administrative fee have been paid. If an offer is not considered received from one party, the certified IDR entity again will select the other party's offer as the final payment amount. So before turning to the final steps of the IDR process, we'll answer a few questions about fees. The first one says, it appears that the general rule about IDR administrative fees, that they are not refundable, particularly when the IDRE makes a determination or when the parties settle. The interim final rules, however, appear to be silent about the fee when the claims are determined to be ineligible for IDR under the NSA. Are the administrative fees refundable? So the administrative fees for the IDR process are non-refundable. However, as we've mentioned before, the fees shouldn't be collected until after the certified IDR entity does the initial screening for whether the uh, items or services are, uh, have eligibility for the federal IDR process. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. In the final stages of the IDR process, the certified IDR entity must select one of the offers submitted by the disputing parties. On, um, oh, sorry, to be the, the out-of-network rate for the qualified IDR item or service. The final payment determination must be made not later than 30 business days after the selection of certified IDR entity. For non-air ambulance disputes, the certified IDR entity will consider the QPAs for the applicable year for the qualified IDR item or service and additional credible information relating to the offer submitted by the parties that relates to the circumstances of the dispute, which is, does not include information on prohibited factors. For air ambulance disputes, the certified IDR entity is responsible for considering whether the information presented by parties is credible, and if credible and not related to prohibited factors, whether the information submitted demonstrates that the QPA is materially different from the appropriate out-of-network rate based on that information. Factors for both types of disputes are described in the updated IDR guidance on cms.gov. A question around what the parties need to submit is, do parties need to submit the EOB or QPA for upload? And Matt, if you could respond. Yeah, so the initiating party should upload the initial payment or the notice of denial of payment with their notice of IDR initiation. Thank you. And finally, the final step is that certified IDR entities must notify the parties and the departments of the certified IDR entity's payment determination and the underlying rationale for its determination. Note the certified IDR entity's payment determination is binding. The amount due to the prevailing party, which is the party whose offer is selected, must be paid not later than 30 calendar days after the determination by certified IDR entities. And so we can now look to a couple of questions that we received um, in addition to those that we have gone over for the, the steps in the process. The first question um, says, will the portal have the ability to request an extension when it launches next week? Alper, if you could respond. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, the answer to that is no. 
a um, little more context here. Certain time periods in the federal IDR process may be extended in the case of extenuating circumstances at the department's discretion. Parties may request an extension and provide applicable attestations by emailing a request for extension due to extenuating circumstances to federal IDR questions at cms.hhs.gov, including an explanation about the extenuating circumstances that require an extension and why the extension is needed. Uh, the requesting party is required to attest that prompt action will be taken to ensure that the determination delayed under the extension will be made as soon as administratively practicable. Um, so, uh, in short, it's important to keep in mind that the ability to request an extension will not be in a web form when we go live. Parties will need to email the federal IDR questions mailbox to request an extension. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Thanks, Amanda. Sorry, couldn't get off mute there for a second. Um, the next question says, would CMS consider, at least for the initial weeks, permitting issuers to not respond to specific IDR notices until CMS, CMS rules, rules on the carrier's extension request, given, given the anticipated IDR, IDR request? request? One moment, I'm going to try to mute. Okay. And the rest of the question, um, it would be helpful if issuers did not have to race to respond to submissions where an extension has been requested. Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So this, this is very similar to what Alper just mentioned. So again, certain time periods in the federal idea process um, may be extended for certain extenuating circumstances, but that's gonna be at the department's discretion. And if parties are looking to request an extension, they can uh, go ahead and make an individual request. And once again, they use that um, email, the federal IDR questions at cms.hhs.gov email and explain how about how the extenuating circumstances that require an extension and why their extension is needed. And the requesting party is then required to attest that prompt action will be taken to ensure that the determination uh, delayed under the extension will be made as soon as administratively practicable. Thanks. Thank you. And I think that we have um, received several questions in the chat. Um, one of them says, what is the IDR mailbox? The IDR mailbox is the mailbox where inquiries can be received and the, um, the address is federal IDR questions at cms.hhs.gov. And that can also be found on cms.gov backslash no surprises. And we can try to drop that into the chat as well. Thank you, Mona, for putting that in the chat. And I see, um, I wanted to give an update that the um, as we've stated in this presentation, the IDR portal um, will go live. Okay. There we go. Um, I think. I, that. I think that you all may have also picked up in the chat a link to the state information where you can see a chart of which states will have an applicable IDR process versus the federal process. Um, there were also resources provided for frequently asked questions, as well as the IDR entity guidance as, and um, IDR disputing party guidance. 
I see a question in the chat that says, how does IDR work when the claim is denied? Matt, is this something you would want to answer or we can always answer offline? Yeah, so if they're talking about um, a notice of denial of payment, then that's that's the um, the the payment or the payer's you know response, and then um, the parties can decide if they want to enter into um, open negotiation, and then if um, a, a settlement or an agreement to a uh, out of network rate is not decided during that open negotiation period, then either parties would be able to then um, initiate the federal IDR process. Thanks, Matt. Amanda, can you restate the go live date? It's this week. The portal will go live this week. So on a Friday? Um, we have not specified that, John. This week, though, the portal will be live. And I wanted to, um, I believe, I'm having a hard time finding it now, but I thought I saw in the chat, possibly someone put in what they thought would be the initiation form. And just to clarify, we will put out the final initiation form for use when the portal goes live. Please do not use any links that have been provided that are not directed from CMS.gov. I also see a question in the chat that says, to clarify the non-initiating party has to send the CMS confirmation to the non-initiating party. CMS is not emailing this to the non-initiating party. And I believe that is referring to the initiation form. And that is correct. CMS is not emailing that information. It is the responsibility of the initiating party to send that to the non-initiating party. The non-initiating party email that they receive from CMS or the federal IDR portal will be the selection process for the IDR entity. I also see questions about whether or not this session is being recorded. And it is being recorded, so we will be able to, um, to share the recording um, for those who may have um, been, been blocked out. My apologies, I didn't realize the capacity limit on this meeting. So again, we will make sure that the recording is sent so that it can be shared with others um, in your organizations. Another question in the chat says, is an initiating provider required to submit support of its offer upon request of a non-initiating issuer or payer? Matt, is that something you could answer? So when it's coming to determination, the initiating party wouldn't, or the non-initiating party wouldn't be requesting support. So that would be up to the um, IDR entity that's making the determination if they're gonna be requesting uh, additional information and then the party would have to provide that information. I'm actually um, talking about in the negotiation process when the initiating party, um, well, I'm sorry, the, the, the non-initiating party is asking that the initiating party provide proof of their demand. So is the non is the initiating party required to provide proof to the non initiating party? I think we can follow up offline to get further clarification of your question. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
Um, and I think as we get ready to wrap up today, I see a question that says, is there a date for the more detailed IDR process training? Um, and we, we do expect that um, in the we will have a more detailed look at the IDR process um, and an actual demonstration of the federal IDR portal. So we will make sure that um, those are open without limitation as we saw with numbers today. Um, and we wanna thank you for your patience as we respond to questions that are coming in, not only in this meeting, but also to the federal IDR questions email box. We encourage you to continue sending questions there regarding IDR, and we will certainly um, be responsive. And again, we appreciate you attending today and your uh, patience with our addressing questions as we move forward. Thank you, Alper and Matt, for your responses today. And we look forward to our next meeting with everybody in just a few weeks. Thank you.